The year is 2019. The 49th World Economic Forum in Davos is taking place. There is still a year before the pandemic, so deglobalization, total skepticism, the US-China trade war, cyber attacks, fake news, and the inevitable climate change catastrophe are on the table. Politicians and economists feel quite uneasy. The journalists who had attended the forum claim it to be one of the darkest and most pessimistic events in the entire history of Davos meetings. A young American writer is probably the only speaker who is smiling and even trying to make jokes. The topic of our report is the psychology of the con. How not to get fooled. It feels like she came to Switzerland to ease the tension and to remind everyone that in the long run, cooperation is more beneficial than conflicts. But I actually want to start somewhere a little bit counterintuitive, which is the importance of trust. Trust is one of the fundamental forces of good in the world. It's the basis of globalism. Societies with higher levels of trust tend to do better. They have stronger institutions. They do better economically. It seems that cooperation actually ends up winning out over antagonism. The other's name is Maria Konnikova. She was introduced as a Harvard graduate, doctor of psychology, and an author of two books, both of which have hit the bestseller list of New York Times. And at some point of her speech in front of all of those presidents, ministers, brokers of the world's biggest stock exchanges and other big shots, Maria suddenly starts to talk about poker. Poker is a really interesting game. If you trust too much, you are going to go broke so quickly, it's not even funny. But the opposite end of the spectrum is just as bad. These are the players who think that everyone's out to get them, that everyone is bluffing, and that this time they're going to catch you. And they end up just as broke as their overly trusting counterparts. The key to success is balance. The thing is, Maria Konikowe was invited to Davos while she was working on her third book, which was exactly about poker. Prior to that, the writer had been studying decision-making and the relationship between will, effort and luck in our life. This search for answers brought Maria to the game and she was invited to share her experiences with the establishment. As we'll find out later, Maria is not the only person who came to realize that poker strategies can be successfully applied outside the game. For instance, in politics. Hi, and welcome to Control Shift, a podcast by Libre Libre Studio and Humble Team. My name is Anatoly Gromov, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we discuss stories of professionals from different spheres, their shifts, and most importantly, the difference they make in the world. In this episode, you'll hear how poker changed global science, politics, business, and the life of one person in particular. Hello, my babies. This is Joe Stapleton and his brand and greeting. He's a commentator for Poker Stars TV shows and live poker broadcasts. He starts every show with this phrase. Joe can understand perfectly well why I was surprised to learn that they talked about poker at the Davos Forum sort of event. It's all about stereotypes. I think that people have two different stereotypes. Neither one is really more accurate than the other. The first would be the stereotype of the the grizzled gambler, the cowboy in the smoky room and the, you know, the the fat sort of greasy mobster type of gambler, which is uh, not accurate much at all anymore. And I think the other sort of poker stereotype is the young man in the hoodie and the sunglasses, you know, just trying to look cool at the poker table. And that one is 
still a little bit, still exists a little bit, I don't, but I don't think that stereotype makes up poker players as much as it used to. Indeed. For a while, poker used to be mainly the game of American cowboys. But in fact, it's much older. According to one version, the closest ancestor of poker appeared in Europe around the 16th century. For centuries, it was wandering from one continent to another, constantly changing and took its present form in the early 20th century. Rather, the time the 52 card deck and hands ranking were settled. For example, flush, five cards all of the same suit, and a full house, three cards of one rank and two of another. At the same time, today's most popular variant of the game was born. It's called Texas Hold'em. The aim of the players in Texas Hold'em is to win the best hand out of the cards they hold and the community cards on the table. First, each player is dealt with two cards face down. No one except you sees your cards. You need to evaluate your hand, meaning to assume whether you have chances to win in this round or not. Then, you are to make a decision either to hold or to keep playing by making a bet. Next. Three cards faced up are dealt on the table, meaning everyone sees them. Taking into account this information, as well as the action of the others, players again evaluate their hand and make a decision – to fold, to stay in the hand, or perhaps to raise. Then another card is dealt faced up and the whole thing repeats. In the end, the dealer puts the fifth card on the table. Eventually, the winner is either the player with the strongest hand or the one, and that's the most interesting feature about poker, who is the best at bluffing and has made his opponents fold before the game ends. In short, the zest of poker is that a player can win the money even with the weakest hand and vice versa, lose with the strongest one. That was the feature of the game that John van Neumann, mathematician and physicist from Hungary, got curious about. They say he was terrible at playing poker. But that wasn't a problem for him, because the prospects of a cash prize was not the reason he loved the game. In 1944, he published a book called Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, co-authored with a US economist Oscar Mungenstern. The book was inspired by the idea that poker is the perfect model for decision-making in real life. How come? In games like chess, go and checkers, players can see all the moves of their opponents. Hypothetically, with proper skill and strong cognitive abilities, they can anticipate the opponent's steps from start to finish. Games like roulette, on the contrary, are ruled by sheer luck. There is no way players can influence the situation. And as for poker, the result depends on both the player's skill and the cards. This game is something in between the blind chance and the total control over the situation. Pretty true to life, isn't it? That's how poker became the basis of game theory. The key concept in today's economics, computer science and political science. A good dozen of Nobel Prizes went to game theorists in the 20th century. By the way, we talked to one of them in one of our previous episodes. We discussed how game theory changed kidney transplantation and saved thousands of lives. I'll leave the link in the description. And back to our story. So, game theory is the mathematics of optimal strategies. The game includes at least two players who make interdependent decisions. To put it simply, I choose what to do based on what I think your strategy is and vice versa. Von Neumann and Morgan Stern explained it with a simplified version of poker. As you know, I love explaining stuff that I'm no expert in, but this time I'll turn it over to the mathematician Adam Kucharski. He has been studying game theory for quite a while and he spoke about it in his TED talk. Von Neumann looked at really, really simplified forms of the game. And one of these was a game where there's just two players that each get a single card and there's one round of betting. And in this situation, von Neumann realized that there was a tug of war going on, because 
In poker, everything you win comes out of your opponent's pocket. So both players are simultaneously trying to maximize what they win while minimize what they hand to their opponent. And studying this game, von Neumann showed that in this tug of war, there's an equilibrium point. There's a point where the forces balance and each player has an optimal strategy so that they wouldn't expect a better outcome if they did something different. And when he worked out this optimal strategy for this very simple game, he found that for the player who goes first, if they get dealt a high card, they should bet. Now, intuitively, that makes sense. If you've got a decent card, you put money on it. He found that if that first player gets dealt a kind of middling value card, they shouldn't bet. They should check and see what happens. Again, intuitively, that makes sense. But he found that the first player, if they get dealt a low value card, should bet. In other words, they should bluff. Now, of course, for centuries, players have been bluffing in games like this, but often it was thought of as something of a quirk of psychology. And here was von Neumann showing that that wasn't the case at all. Bluffing was a mathematical necessity in these games if you wanted the optimal strategy. In contrast to conventional sports games, where only one player or team can win, in game theory there are certain types of games that allow several winners in case each player follows the optimal strategy. This win-win situation is called Nash Equilibrium. It was named after the US mathematician and Nobel Prize winner John Nash, who derived equilibrium based on Morgenstern's and Newman's concepts. You must have heard of him, as the film A Beautiful Mind was inspired by his life story. Years later, economists, philosophers, biologists, and even political experts got interested in this model. For example, with the help of a version of the model, you can forecast how competition between two biological species will develop. Or you can easily prove that the Cold War between the Soviets and US was a mistake. For 45 years, two empires played a non-cooperative game. Both of them spent huge amounts of money and weapons to win the race. And actually, both opponents could have won if they had agreed to stop and spend the resources on healthcare or science, for instance. But they never trusted each other. So, instead of following the optimal strategy and reaching natural equilibrium, they continued to produce weapons, most of which have never been used. Long story short, hypothetically, game theory is a good tool to settle any conflict be it political crisis or, I don't know, property division and divorce. Another fun fact. Nash Equilibrium, derived from poker, has recently closed a full circle and is back to the gambling table. I started doing poker commentary in 2009. It was kind of the first time that people really started taking a deeply analytical look at the game using massive amounts of data. Probably like around 2012 or 2013 is when, you know, game theory optimal really started to take hold that. So, you know, it went from becoming sort of a, a nerdy mathematician. It went from being, the, you know, the, the smoky gambler game to the nerdy mathematician game now to like the AI driven game. Looks like a very logical transformation. Like many other spheres nowadays, poker went digital and stepped towards big data and machine learning. Fair to assume that as a result, it has also become less humane, but not quite, as we'll see further. In poker, there is still a big room for psychology. The field of expertise Maria Konnikova actually came from to join the game. Maria Konnikova was born in Moscow in 1984. When she was four years old, her parents moved from the USSR to the US. Today, when she speculates on the rule of luck in our lives, she calls it the greatest luck in her own story. Next, there was college and Harvard with honors. Maria studied creative writing and public administration and got her PhD in psychology. Her scientific advisor was Walter Michel. Even if this name doesn't ring a bell, you've definitely heard about the marshmallow test, probably the best known experiment in psychological research. 600 children between the ages of 3 and 6 were left in the room alone with a marshmallow. Researchers gave them a choice, to eat it immediately or 
to have the second marshmallow if they go 15 minutes without eating the first one. Many years later, Walter gathered the test subjects again and interviewed them. It turned out that children with stronger will developed higher intelligence and achieved greater success in life. Konnikova was the one to help Michelle with repeated testing. The deductions still spark controversy, as quote-unquote strong-willed children seem to be from richer families. But what really matters to our story is that meanwhile Konnikova was conducting her own research, and it suggested something curious. High intelligence and great success often backfire. That's how Konnikova explains it in one of her lectures. When I was doing psychology, I actually was researching how people learned in risky and uncertain environments. And I found something really, really interesting, which was that the smartest people, the people you'd think would learn the best, ended up not taking feedback from the environment when it was negative because they thought so highly of themselves. Their reasoning was, I'm smart, I've got this, your feedback sucks. And the people who weren't quite as good at their jobs, they took the feedback and they're like, oh, I don't get this either, maybe I should learn, and they ended up performing a lot better. After graduating from Harvard, Konnikova kept on researching how people analyze information and make decisions. Soon she published her first book, Mastermind How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. She studied the episodes from Conan Doyle's books from the perspective of today's neurobiological studies and came to the conclusion that clear logical thinking and sharp perception are not innate talents but skills. However, you can build them only in case you're ready to receive any feedback from real life and to stay mentally flexible. And then I became fascinated by this idea of the illusion of control in general. How much of our lives do we control? What can we learn? How far can learning take us? Where do the limits of skill lie? 2015 was a turning point for Konnikova. She turned 31. By this point, she got married and released her second book, this time about the psychology of cons. And alas, here her rough patch began. Her mother, who was an IT specialist in one of the Silicon Valley companies, got fired. Then Maria's grandmother died. One day she got up from the bed, slipped, hit her head, and two days later she passed away. Several months later, Maria's husband, an IT specialist as well, lost his job. Hence their family had to live only on her royalties. Last but not least, Maria got an autoimmune disease. Whenever exposed to the environment, her skin developed a rash and none of the doctors knew how to cure that weird allergy. Marie's entire research and life experience evidence that people can take charge of their own lives. We can practice to think logically and to analyze reality like Sherlock Holmes. We can improve willpower and self-control. We can work hard and everything should be fine. But all of a sudden, the writer found herself in a situation where nothing seemed to depend on her. The only thing Konnikova controlled was her attitude towards what was happening. And she made a decision. Keep calm and carry on researching. At first, Maria tried to find answers in books. She was searching for something about chances and patterns. And guess what? She came across theory of games and economic behavior. The others claimed that poker, which is a mix of luck and skills, can help with life decisions. Inspired by that, Konnikova came up with yet another experiment, but this time she was the subject. The new experiment consisted in the following. To figure out what depends on her in her life and what is ruled purely by chance. To see if one can learn to make optimal decisions in puzzling situations. She has to master poker. And after that, perhaps to write a book about it. Konnikova has never played cards before. All her knowledge was limited to the 1998 film Rounders 
which she watched by chance a long time ago. Young Matt Damon plays a talented poker player who manages to outplay the main villain, the owner of the underground casino and the mob boss nicknamed Teddy KGB, performed by John Malkovich. The game in question is No Limit Texas Hold'em. Minimum buy-in, $25,000. A game like this doesn't come together often outside the casinos. The stakes attract rich flounders, and they in turn attract the sharks. No Limit Texas Hold'em is the Cadillac of poker. The key to the game is playing the man, not the cards. To learn to play, Konnikova needed a poker mentor. At that moment she must have remembered rounders. Because during one scene Matt Damon's character is watching the broadcast of the World Series of Poker, a big event, something like a world championship. A documentary video from 1988 appears on the screen, which is a real fragment of an iconic game in poker history. Reigning world champion Johnny Chan is playing with a promising newcomer, Eric Seidel. Eric Seidel cannot win this hand, and yet he doesn't know it. Chan is trying to sucker him in. By taking his time, Johnny Chan has a queen high straight. Will Eric Seidel fall for the bait? Yes, he's going all in and Chan has him. Johnny Chan the master. This is one of the most famous card deal in the world. Chan had a straight and Seidel had only a couple of queens. In the end, Chan won $700,000 and Seidel took second place and $280,000. The thing is that during the whole final round, Chan persistently pretended that he had a weak hand and Seidel fell into this trap. This strategy is called slow play and means playing cautiously not to reveal good cards. As the TV viewers could see the cards of both players, the show was absolutely terrific. Poker is believed to start thriving after this battle had been broadcasted on TV in 1988, getting great attention from the media. And, well, another leap of fame happened after Rounders was released. Konnikova found out that this very Eric Seidel, unlike many players from the 80s, still plays poker. Today he's one of the most famous players in the world and member of the Poker Hall of Fame. Successful career this long is quite unusual since poker has changed a lot since his early years. If 30 years ago players paid more attention to reading their opponent and understanding their psychology, today maths and game theory are running the show. Every professional player has a subscription to one or several solvers. It's a computer software that helps to make optimal decisions. You enter all available information, start the algorithm, and the program gives you the optimal strategy. So, Konnikova's choice fell on the living legend of poker Eric Seidel, who didn't rust and continued to compete against poker algorithm advocates. Marie wrote him a letter asking to become her teacher. Here are the conditions of the experiment she developed. She'll have a year under Eric's guidance to learn to play poker from scratch and reach the level that allows her to take part in WSOP main event. For this year, poker will become her entire life. She'll play 10 hours a day, analyzing hands and learning to use solvers, and then she'll write a book about the results. And Maria has to make $10,000 from poker. That is the main event participation fee. Seidel agreed to teach her for free, and here is why, as seen by Joe Stapleton. Poker is very insular. You know, there's media, but it's poker media. And there's people writing books, but they're poker people writing books. And so when someone as accomplished as Maria and someone who is, you know, connected to that real world that can get the message of poker out to real people, you know, one of the problems with poker is that it constantly has to be growing. There have to be new people joining the game. It's just how it works. It's just how the poker economy works. So for Maria to be able to reach a new audience, a group of people who buy her books, who read books, who maybe 
have a misconception about what poker is. That sort of thing is something that the poker community is very excited about. Eric Seidel, obviously smart enough. You know, Eric is not an easy person to get a hold of for interviews, for coaching, for stuff like that. But he's smart enough to realize, hey, this is good for poker. In 2017, a 20-day tournament Brains vs. Artificial Intelligence took place. The Libretis program played against dozens of experienced poker players and won almost $2 million from them. It was play money, though. This news reached all the world media, and later the Libretis creators, scientists from Carnegie Mellon University, published the analysis of the bot in scientific journals, giving credit to von Neumann and Morgenstern. Before that, software developers from all over the world had tried to create a successful poker bot for like 20 years. At first, algorithms could outplay only a newbie, but gradually self-learning poker newer nets started to appear. They played millions of games against real and computer opponents, analyzed the hands, and developed the optimal strategy for each scenario possible. Why is it worth our attention? We have already discussed that chess and go are games with full information. Both players can see each other's moves and they don't have to suppose or guess anything. Poker is different. Equilibrium strategies imply bluffing. And what's natural for a human is actually quite challenging for a computer. Of course, the choice between, as Konikova puts it, qualitative versus measurable, human versus algorithmic is a matter of taste. Every year poker bots develop more and more tactics that may seem counterintuitive for real players, but in fact they lead to winning. The best poker players are busy with daily analysis of algorithm play. Competition in the games with big limits has become as big as ever. And a side effect of these poker bots is an AI that makes decisions changes strategies and bluffs just like a real human. Naturally, it can be used not only in virtual poker rooms. For example, right now, similar algorithms are trying to calculate the outcome of the war between Russia and Ukraine. Bots and solvers have changed the world of poker forever. As a result, an outsider like Konnikova can definitely learn something about the game in one year and even try themselves at the gambling table, but big success is not too realistic. At the same time, it was exactly the end goal Konnikova wanted to achieve – to start winning at the highest levels. Her plan was a bit too ambitious, perhaps. However, Maria did have some advantages knowledge and experience from psychology. For example, she found out that the theory she developed in her own studies works at the table as well. The players who are too smart and too pragmatic refuse to reconsider their strategies and lose more often. Although the experience in studying cons didn't save her from cheaters at the poker table. A couple of times she ran into opponents who won her trust, loved her vigilance and unexpectedly took her out of the game. And she got the answer to the main question, what's more important, skill or luck, almost right away. She came across the research by Chicago economists who analyzed WSOP games and calculated that on average amateurs lose about 15% of their entrance fee, whereas professionals win over 30%, meaning that the level of the player is directly connected to their winnings. Yet. Lots of things were still surprising to Maria. For instance, that the notorious poker face actually does work. Psychologist Michael Slepian, who studied the ways of keeping things secret, researched how poker plays bluff. He showed some videos with people playing to volunteers and found out that they couldn't tell if the player had a good card from their facial expressions. However, when respondents saw the video of gestures players used to make bids, their response was far more accurate. 
Marie spent a couple of months on training how not to reveal herself with movements and behavior. The way you look at the cards, move the chips, speak and laugh. In addition to that, Konikova discovered that gender stereotypes are very strong in poker. There is about 3-5% to of women among professional poker players, and men are often taken aback by female players at the table. So they change the line of their play. Some of them want to be gentlemen, and they emphatically avoid bluffing against female opponents. Others, on the contrary, try to prove that a woman's place is at the kitchen, not the gambling table, and consistently play against women. Konnikova says that she learned to use both to her advantage. She's quietly absorbing which of the two tactics her opponent chooses and tries to comply with their expectations. And then, at the most unexpected moment, she starts to play aggressively. I think that we don't always, as a community, do a great job of being welcoming. I know not all men, not everyone's a dick at the poker table, but plenty of people are. And we have to understand that like being sort of a dick to the guy next to us is received a lot differently than being sort of a dick to the woman sitting next to us just because of the way power dynamics work in the world. It's not, you know, it's it, you, you can't treat everyone exactly the same, even though ideally that's what we're supposed to do. So I think that we can do a better job of sort of um, st sticking up for anyone who is new to the game, but especially women. You know, something we're always talking about in poker is how do we get more women to play the game? Because at the moment, the game appears to let's just say for argument's sake you know 50 percent of the population and if we could somehow get the other 50 percent interested in poker uh that would be really good for our game too according to eric seidel's plan konikova had a year to go through several training stages first she was only to read poker theory and watch tournaments of experienced players then to play online next to take part in low-stake live tournaments and only when maria would start to win against players of her level consistently the teacher would allow her to participate in serious competitions konikova followed that trajectory obediently and by the way her poker experience very soon started to influence her life decision making as anticipated for example when she came back from her first trip to las vegas maria said the first no to her agent who offered to take part in an event for a small fee. Marie refused as the pay was way too low. She told the engine that the presentation costs much more. You take much less sheet from people than you used to, Konikova's husband said. On May 2, 2018, Marie woke up as an internet star, just a year after her first lesson with Eric. It all began with an article on Poker News, which described Konikova's first win in a big poker tournament. The headline read, The writer postponed the release of her book because she started to make too much money playing. This news had picked up on Twitter and Marie was bombarded with calls from the British Times and Daily Mail, French Le Monde and American Newsweek. Let me remind you that at this point Maria has already been the author of two bestsellers, but she never received so much attention from the press before. The headlines were partly true. Just before the publication, Konikova announced on her social media that release of her book is put off until 2019. And a couple of months before she had the first major win, she took $86,000 in a final game of PCA National. A bit later, Konikova won the second place in Asia Pacific Poker and took $57,000 more. An impressive result for a newbie. The book's release wasn't delayed because Konikova lost interest in the royalties. Together with Eric, she decided that a year deadline was somewhat artificial and too optimistic, and she had so much more to learn. As they planned, she took part in the main event, but wasn't fully ready to play at that level, and didn't go any further than the second day of the tournament. But let's admit, Konikova has done a tremendous job within this year. The key to her success included daily training, constant correction of her playstyle and meetings with the best world poker players recommended by Eric Seidel. 
But without luck, those efforts could not guarantee her $150,000 that brought her to the top of the Twitter, and consequently to Davos. Poker is a, a great basic skill that I think everyone should have. I think everyone should know how to play poker. It's just such a simple and such a pure game. And the 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 concepts in it, even if you don't realize you're learning something about risk, how to make decisions, decision making is just a really, really uh, fantastic byproduct of playing lots of poker. I do think it's an adult game for grownups. You know, what, what parents choose to do with their kids in home or, you know, is, is a totally different story. So I'm not really sure about schools, but like, you know, like university. University. I do think that taking a course on games in general uh, is something that would be very helpful. You know, I think there's there's plenty to be learned from from Go to Mahjong to chess to poker. I'll be honest with you. I don't play poker. I've never played poker, I've never watched poker, and all the things I've explained to you I've studied for this episode. But that doesn't mean I cannot relate. And well, the story I told you has plenty of turns. How Maria happened to discover poker, her decision to conduct the experiment, and then how she took poker experience and introduced it in her own life. And that's not counting the story of poker itself. But I want us to dwell on one of the shifts in particular, namely how Maria's knowledge and experience unexpectedly came in handy in a totally different context. Because, you see, this is not uncommon. I'll tell you about one of the latest cases in Humble Team's business. By the way, a quick reminder, Humble Team is a digital product design agency that helps startups and enterprises to create and grow their digital products and brands. But first, a little background. Not that long ago, career path and design was very straightforward. You make, I don't know, magazine covers, then you make banners, then you make websites, and here you are, an accomplished designer. But now everything has changed. One day you are an iron worker, and the next you work on a fintech app. As you can probably guess, I didn't make it out of thin air. So to the story. Humble team has been working on a fintech app that works with invoicing. The team could not figure out the right pricing model. Because, for example, $50 is an OK price for a small family restaurant. And of course, it's an OK price for a Canadian Railway National Company too. But that would be a shame to charge Canadian Railway 50 bucks, right? You can charge them 100 times higher, that's still an insignificant cost for them, but a major difference for us. So for a month nobody could figure this out. Until one day, one of the managers hears this and goes, Yeah, that's actually easy. I can tell you what we did at that factory I used to work at. This guy has worked 10 years on the fixture production. During Covid he lost his job and decided to take a risk and try himself in startups. The factory got a whole range of clients from local carpenters who needed fixtures to attach doors to cabinets to aircraft manufacturers who needed fixtures to attach landing gear wheels. And they came up with a solution. They asked clients not only for blueprints but also for their websites. Then they looked at the company's size and estimated what price it is reasonable to set classic price discrimination. So Humble Team did the same thing but with an upgrade. Their program that estimates popularity based on the number of Google search results. Who would have thought, right? That a former fixture seller would improve the financial model of a fintech app. Anyways, if you're a team lead or an HR, consider hiring people outside of your own bubble because it seems like startups are a great place to use knowledge and experience gained from years of psychology research, working in a factory, or you name it. And by the way, if you are curious about other Humble Team cases, you can find more stories on humbleteam.com. 
Control Shift was brought to you by Libro Libro Studio and Humble Team. Music for this episode was created by Kira Weinstein and also special thanks to Blue Dot Session. The names of everybody who worked on the episode you can find in the description. And I'm your host, Anatoly Gromov. See you in the next one.